When lockdown started last year, we braced it together with our much-valued viewers. We tried to understand COVID-19, the science and the politics, the treatment and vaccine prospects, and of course, absorb the economic shocks. We did more than 50 stories grappling with our new normal. Now we wanted to see how the people we met along the way were doing. So Clem Oisa called them up. It's hard to imagine that that was our lives less than 18 months ago. And I'm not talking about the rugby. I'm talking about filled stadiums, strangers standing shoulder to shoulder, packed restaurants, no mask in sight, and people high-fiving and even hugging. But 2020 changed all of that. Since early last year, we've been documenting the impacts of COVID-19 on our lives. We've spoken to survivors, the heroes on the front lines, the innovators and the vulnerable, sharing stories of bravery and loss. You realize you're more human than you would like to believe. It really was my worst nightmare to give birth alone. We're all uncertain. We don't know where, where this ends. More than a year of lockdown, travel restrictions and financial hardship have made life challenging for everyone and the tourism and food and beverage industries were hit hard. Unfortunately, like so many restaurants across the country, even popular, well-established ones could not survive the last year. Business interruption insurance was meant to be a lifeline in case of unforeseen disasters. But some claimants found that it was almost impossible to meet qualifying criteria. For our cover to kick in, the viral threat would have to originate at our business. For the past 12 months, Scott Cochrane's guest house in Pretoria has been mostly empty. I have been without an income basically for a year and really have been having to be innovative to survive. Fed up, he took his case to the ombudsman and after a year-long battle and a mountain of paperwork, he finally did get an insurance payout. At least it's a bit of relief. It uh, can keep us going while we uh, make plans to, uh, to open up again and, and get going. If I look at the tally of what lockdown was for me is I lost three restaurants, had to relocate one, and, 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 and in, improvisation has been the name of the game. When Joburg restaurateur James Dyack closed his doors at the beginning of lockdown last year, he had no idea what the future would bring. So James, the last time I saw you, you were actually locking the restaurant because lockdown was going to start the following day. How has the last 12 months been like for you? Look, the last 12 months has been a, pr a properly rocky ride. Um, we, the last time you saw me leave that restaurant was the last time I left that restaurant. We never re reopened or reoperated re down there. While some businesses managed to return to a new normal after the initial lockdown restrictions were lifted, Dayak says it was a slow recovery for his eateries. And finally, at the beginning of December, he managed to reopen his trademark restaurant at a new location in Johannesburg. We had to literally creep creep, creep back into it. And still, as we sit today, we're still only running at 60%. Status of cash flow right now? Um, status of cash flow is we can play our suppliers today. And then we'll hopefully have a busy night and we can pay some more suppliers tomorrow. Everyone is struggling. Economists estimate that more than 500,000 formal jobs have been lost since 2019 and our GDP slumped by 7%. Immediately after the lockdown, three weeks later, the massive hunger started in the country. Founder of the humanitarian organization Gift of the Givers, Dr. Imtia Suleiman, has first-hand knowledge of the desperate situation many South Africans found themselves in. A mother takes a food parcel and then she tells us, thank you very much for this, but talk to my children. They will tell you the taste of every plant in this area. Last year, they were eating tortoises, lizards and frogs. Over the past year, Gift of the Givers set up over 100 feeding centers around the country, and they've been tirelessly handing out hundreds of thousands of food parcels to assist the most vulnerable. Physically, mentally, emotionally, you guys have been busy, you're on the ground, you're on the front line. How are you doing? Claire, you know, it may sound strange. My teams are built for this. You can't stop them. You can't hold them back. They've worked without exaggeration from the 15th of March to today without a single day's break. Besides feeding people and tirelessly providing water to drought-stricken communities, Gift of the Givers has been at the forefront of supplying PPE and equipment to under-resourced hospitals and clinics. 
it's gotten to a point where we choose who's worth a recess attempt or we choose who's worth oxygen. We first met Dr. Tado Muloko in August last year when she filmed a video diary of her life at the Baragwanath Medical Emergency Unit during the first wave. What came out in the story that you did was that there was not enough of everything. Mm -hmm. Did it get worse than what we saw? Yes. So second wave was maybe not as many numbers, but we were seeing worse cases. So ICU got full. We ran out of oxygen. We ran out of supply. And now you have someone who not only requires oxygen, but requires intubation, and we do not have anything. What then happens? You document, and you pray, and you call, and you ask, and you use it for this long, and then you stop, and then you use it here. And the resource problem has not gotten better. We ran out of swabs at one point. Even at the outset of the pandemic, it became clear that medical professionals on the front line would need additional support. And when Kim Whitaker was diagnosed as patient number 42 in March last year, she had a light bulb moment. I thought, oh, maybe we could build a platform to connect healthcare workers to um, to empty hotels, etc. I called a friend of mine in Johannesburg. I said, I want to launch it on Monday morning. And he was like, my team's so keen, we're going to do it. This is one hotel of over a thousand that are part of the Ubuntu Beds Network, an initiative started to support healthcare workers. To date, almost 30,000 nights have been booked, giving over a thousand doctors and nurses a home away from home. And there are plans to expand the platform to assist in other disasters. So what we have trialed um, so far is how, what would it look like if we used our platform, for example, in the case of a township fire? So in Guguletu, there was a township fire about six months ago. We had about uh, 20 families displaced. And within three hours, we had them placed in a guest house. And so we're hoping that we're going to be able to use the technology that, that was built to help uh, people in need in future and keep, to keep the spirit of Ubuntu alive, really. Late last year, I met some mothers who shared their lockdown birthing experiences. And finally, I get to meet their bundles of joy. Robin Janssen van Furen went into premature labor during lockdown. And because of COVID protocols, she ended up giving birth alone without the support of her husband. It was so sudden. The nurses and the doctors wheeled me into theater in full protective gear. Allegra is almost a year old and already quite familiar with She's Zoom calls, as you can see. She's unlikely to cooperate. No, that's exactly what we want. That was a brief. The brief oh, was good. that she's following the brief to the T. As a mother, have you been OK? Because the first year, it's tough as a new mom. I think we definitely became a lot more proficient at parenting more quickly than perhaps we would have under other circumstances. On reflection, when you think about your birth story, what do you think? Uh... <laughs> it is just the way she came into the world. I, I have nothing to compare it to. And the experience brought me my daughter, who is just the like most amazing little bundle of energy and joy and light. Chiwela Makwatana's son, Zachariah, was also born in lockdown. Although the initial experience was somewhat traumatic, she says the family is healthy and happy, and she sent me some pictures. It is such a joy and blessing to have him in our family. As my other two, enjoy having him around. As we move into the second year of the global pandemic, there's an air of hopefulness as vaccine programs are being rolled out and people are slowly rebuilding their lives. What were some of the lessons learned that will change the way you do business, perhaps forever? Diversify. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. And then try and be the best. Um, because people are really short of cash. So we, you know, if people are going to choose an amazing, well, one spoiled month, we have to be that person. Was there any point during this journey where you think, I just want to opt out? Yes, multiple times. 
it's when you're at work and you're pushing and what you're doing is not enough and someone still does. Or you have to let them die because there's, there's nowhere else for them to go. There's no ICU bed. I can't watch the news. I can't look at the numbers anymore. I just look at the survivors, the preventions, that I could, could have lost this patient, but we did good. We saved this patient's life today. And I might have lost five today, but I saved one. Thank you for watching our stories here online. And please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.